Hello Aviators, Sky here, and today we are taking another leap to the stars, and more so on a rocket which is considered to be the flagship of American space industry, at least until recently. Our hero is the heir of an eminent family, the main transport of the United Launch Alliance and the heaviest launch vehicle in the world, at least it was until recently. A strange combination of delight and disappointment, meet the orange and white giant, the ULA Delta IV. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Liftoff of the mighty Delta IV heavy rocket with NASA's Parker Solar Probe, a daring mission to shed light on the mysteries of our closest star, the Sun. The history of the Delta family began not with the Delta. The PGM-17 ballistic missile, created in the late 1950s, pompously as it should be, was named after the Norse god of thunder Thor and was a great pride of Douglas aircraft. It did not claim to be the main US nuclear hammer. Thor was rather modest in size and weight and was not an intercontinental but an intermediate range missile, so it was not so much America that became its home but rather bases in Europe, primarily in the United Kingdom. Quite quickly, Thor started to become obsolete, and on duty, the military began to replace it with more advanced missiles, and it began to find itself other roles – civilian. More or less a common thing for that time, an example of which can be the American Atlas or the Soviet R-7. At first glance, it may seem strange that a single-stage medium missile became the base for a space carrier, but the ingenuity of the rocket scientists worked. It was possible to turn this missile into a decent first stage of something bigger. To launch light satellites into orbit, to the Thor stage was added the second stage named Delta. By the way, no one promised this rocket a long life. NASA from the very beginning positioned the Delta as a temporary solution. The rocket's capabilities were rather modest. It could launch about 290 kilograms or 640 pounds of payload into the low Earth orbit, but for its time it was not bad. Those were the 1960s, it was necessary to accelerate the expansion into space, and the creation of new carriers took time. Saturn wasn't built in a day. The Thor Delta couple continued to evolve, and over time, the number of modifications became so significant that little remained of the original ballistic missile, and the complex began to be called simply Delta. This is how one of the longest running families of American carrier rockets was born. By the end of the 1970s, the number of modifications exceeded a dozen, and the number of launches reached 84, 91% of which were successful. Not the ultimate dream, of course, but not bad for that time. In the late 1980s, the Delta II rocket was created, and by the end of the 1990s, the world saw the Delta III launch vehicle, already the brainchild of Boeing, which by then merged with McDonnell Douglas. The Delta III was a fairly powerful rocket, with a launch mass of up to 300 tons, 660,000 pounds, and capable of placing more than 8 tons, 18,000 pound loads into low orbit. However, it could not boast of its successes. Only three launches were performed, two of which were unsuccessful. Not a great statistic. Around that time, Boeing came to the conclusion that it was no longer possible to endlessly torment the rocket with upgrades and initiated a program to create a full-fledged new generation. The military supported this idea, at least the Air Force needed a more efficient heavy carrier for its evolved expendable launch vehicle or EELV program, which they have been running since the mid-1990s and are still running, now under the name NSSL – National Security Space Launch. When developing the Delta IV concept, Boeing adhered to the rather popular paradigm of creating a family of highly unified carriers for a wide range of tasks. The core of these rockets was supposed to be universal modules with the ability to assemble different carriers from them. A very serious step was the abandoning of the kerosene liquid oxygen fuel pair in favor of the liquid hydrogen liquid oxygen pair. In fact, a controversial decision. Hydrogen is certainly good, but its use in the entire rocket and in such a huge one clearly doesn't simplify things and does not make it cheaper. On the other hand, the choice of such a fuel made it possible to reduce the mass of a powerful and large rocket, 
very large. If you look at carriers of different generations separately, you might not notice that the Delta IV, to put it mildly, is larger than its predecessors. The same decision made it possible to reduce the role of solid propellant boosters. At least we no longer see these huge drums in cycling the stages. This solution reduced the cost and improved reliability. Maybe the explosion of Delta II in 1997 got stuck in the memory. The fireworks were gorgeous, but still, this is not what the rockets are made for. In fact, the name Delta on the rocket signifies the family ties and a tribute of respect. Delta IV has little in common with its predecessors. Let's take a closer look at the rocket, starting with the same universal modules, which are called Common Booster Core, or CBC. 40.8 meters, or 134 feet high, and 5.1 meters, 17 feet in diameter. The approximate widths of the Boeing 767's fuselage, decently larger than the Atlas V, and a bit smaller than the Ariane 5. From top to bottom, in the upper part of the module, there is the transition compartment, which houses the second stage engine and the decoupling equipment. Next, the fuel part. There are two tanks inside each module, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Physics comes to us. Due to the fact that oxygen is much denser than hydrogen, it occupies the small upper tank, while less dense hydrogen with many times lower mass occupies the large tank below. At the same time, both gases are contained in a liquid state only in hellish cold. Oxygen at refueling has a temperature of minus 185 degrees Celsius, and hydrogen is almost at the absolute zero, minus 253 degrees. To prevent the icing of the rocket and reduce fuel heating before launch, the boosters are covered in thermal isolation foam, which gives them a familiar rusty orange color. The solution is not new. For the same reason, the outer tank of the Space Shuttle was similarly rusty orange. Since the hydrogen tank is located near the engine, it is supplied almost directly, while oxygen is supplied through a pipeline mounted on the outer shell, so it is visible from the outside. The fiery heart of Delta IV rockets is something cool. If you look at the rocket, especially its heavy modification, you can see an interesting thing. The huge structure is lifted into the sky by only three engines. This is the Rocketdyne RS-68, the most powerful oxygen-hydrogen engine in the world. While creating it, Rocketdyne and Boeing pursued several goals. The most important of them is minimizing the cost of the rocket. Considering that it is not reusable, it was necessary to ensure that its most expensive part, the power plant, was cheaper. For this, it was decided to install as few engines as possible, so there is one of them per module, and to make the engine itself simpler. Despite the fact that the engine is often compared with another famous creation of Rocketdyne, the Monster F1 from the Saturn V rockets, the RS-68 nevertheless is much closer to their other brainchild, the RS-25, which was put in threes in the tails of the space shuttles, and was also powered by the hydrogen-oxygen pair. Surprisingly, the 68s is in fact the next cryogenic engine after the 25th, and between them by the way there are several decades of either progress or stagnation. Compared to its relative, the RS-68 is simpler, it has much fewer parts, it is easier to manufacture and maintain. However, this also has a side effect. Unlike the fiery heart of the shuttle, which was considered a miracle of engineering, the 68 seems to be very basic technologically. A simple gas generator power cycle engine, with clearly not outstanding parameters of specific impulse and thrust. The simplification is noticeable even by the sight of the exhaust from the engine. While the RS-25 on the shuttles had a pure flame jet, behind the RS-68 it blazes like an old burner. To reduce the cost of production, the complex cooling system was replaced with a simple graphite coating that burns out in flight and dyes the exhaust red. But do not underestimate the RS-68. It is still a 6.6-ton .6 monster with 2,950 kilonewtons of thrust at sea level, the most powerful hydrogen fuel engine ever built. But let's just say if it wasn't for the struggle with the price tag, it could have been even more epic. The engine has improved. In 2012 was the first launch of Delta IV with the forced RS-68A engines, the thrust of which reached 3130 kN at sea level. 
most of it is hidden by a coating that protects the internal systems from the aggressive effects of neighboring engines, especially the solid boosters. On the outside there is only the nozzle, very pretty. A small story arc about the solid fuel boosters. On the Delta IV, their role was decently reduced compared to their predecessors, but they were not abandoned completely. Some versions of the rocket, which we'll talk about later, use Northrop Grumman Gem 60 boosters. They are part of the family of solid propellant boosters that have been with the Deltas since the times of previous generations, and their new versions will go to the promising Vulcan rockets. The Gem 60 boosters on the Deltas create 879 kN of thrust at sea level. Not the largest and most powerful in this family, but working together with the effective main engines, they are quite enough. The second stage of Delta IV is also cryogenic, and it is called accordingly, the Delta Cryogenic Second Stage, or DCSS. It is probably the only major legacy of the Delta III rocket, although it has been heavily modified. The stage received the RL-10B2 engine, with a thrust of about 110 kN, working on a pair of liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. By the way, it is the brother of the RL-10A, installed on the Centaur stage of Atlas V, small world. A feature of the engine on the Delta IV is an interesting design of the nozzle, which is initially folded, and in flight, after separation of the stage, it extends, increasing the thrust performance in vacuum. Initially, two versions of the stage were created, with a diameter of 4 meters, 13 feet, and 5 meters, 16 feet, differing mainly in the amount of fuel. From the outside they can also be distinguished. While the 5 meter second stage looks like a direct continuation of the first, the 4 meter one creates a narrowing at the transition between the stages. Now however you will not see this anymore. On the heavy versions only 5 meter stages are used, and the mediums are not popular nowadays. Finally, the top of the rocket, payload placement and fairings. Basic for the medium versions of the Delta IV is a fairing with a diameter of 4 meters, a continuation of the second stage of the same size. There are also larger options, with a diameter of 5 meters and various lengths, from 14.3 meters 47 feet, to 19.1 meters 62.7 feet. They are now the main ones. Let's finally look at the options. Throughout the entire life of the program, the rockets were divided into two main groups, Delta IV Medium and Delta IV Heavy. There were ideas for a light carrier, but we know the size of the rocket. These ideas were abandoned almost immediately, back in 1999. Let's go from simple to complex with reference to indexes. The basic version is called simply Delta IV Medium. Here there is one CBC module, a 4 meter DCSS second stage, and a 4 meter payload fairing. Such a rocket is capable of launching a load weighing up to 8.8 .8 tons into the low earth orbit and up to 4.5 tons into the geostationary transfer orbit. This is with the old RS-68 engine. An option with the new RS-68A is also offered, but in practice it has never been launched and probably never will be. The next version, Delta IV Medium Plus 4.2, is similar to the basic medium, but with the connection of two solid propellant boosters. Together with the RS-68A engine, this team is capable of launching loads weighing up to 12 tons into the low Earth orbit, and into the geotransfer orbit 6.4 tons, already a decent carrier. The Delta IV Medium Plus 5.2 option differs from its predecessors in a more spacious 5 meter fairing. This makes it possible to place larger loads, although their mass is slightly cut. 10.2 tons for the low Earth and almost 5.2 for the geotransfer orbit. More suitable for heavy loads can be considered the Medium Plus 5.4 version with four solid propellant boosters. They already allow to launch 12.8 tons into the low and 7.3 tons into geotransfer orbit respectively. Finally, we come to the heaviest and most recognizable option, the Delta IV Heavy. There are no more games with fairings, and solid fuel boosters are not used. The Heavy version is an assembly of three CBC modules, a large second stage, and 5 meter fairings. The Delta IV Heavy, the current flagship of the United Launch Alliance, is capable of launching a payload weighing more than 28 tons into the low Earth orbit, and 14.2 tons into the geotransfer orbit. 
Launching a rocket with several identical modules has its own nuances. As part of the carrier's flight scheme, the two side boosters are spent and decoupled, while the central core continues to work a little longer. Since the amount of fuel in the CBCs is the same, the engineers had to play with thrusts a bit in order to save some in the middle. At the moment of the rocket launch, the side modules bring their engines to the maximum, 102% of thrust, while the central one works at a minimum, 58% for about 50 seconds. Due to this, by the time the side modules are empty and detached, the central one remains in service, reaches 102% thrust, and drops again to 58 before decoupling the second stage from itself. Quite a throttle dance. By the way, at the moment of launching the rocket, many may notice a rather unusual phenomenon. Huge tongues of flame that absorb the lower part of the rocket and cover it in suit. Sure, there's always a fire at launch, but usually it is a roaring bright flash, similar to an explosion. And here, there is a pure flame. The fact is that, at the time the start is announced, hydrogen is driven through the engine, which in a non-combustible state is thrown out. Only after a second or two, oxygen finally goes into the mix, ignition occurs in the engines, the hydrogen cloud in the lower part of the rocket ignites, and we see what we see. This is not some kind of malfunction, this is the way it should be. The rocket was created at a fairly fast pace. The first firing tests of the engines in the CBC unit were carried out already in 2001, and at the end of 2002, the rocket in its most basic version made its maiden flight from Cape Canaveral. It took another two years to complete the top version of Delta IV Heavy. The first test launch was performed in December 2004, and it was not a success. All three units got shut down in flight. Out of three satellites, the main demonstration one went into an incorrect orbit, and two of its companions did not reach orbit at all. As it turned out, a cavitation effect occurred in the pipeline of the oxygen tanks, which destabilized the supply of oxidant into the engines and provoked a failure. The problem was resolved and no longer reminded of itself. It can be noted that out of more than four dozen Delta IV launches, this was the only unsuccessful one. For a long time, the Delta IV Heavy was considered the heaviest carrier rocket in the world in terms of maximum load, competing with the Proton M and Ariane 5. But now it has lost the championship to the impudent newcomer, the Falcon Heavy. It's funny, if you look at these rockets outwardly, they are quite close in overall dimensions, they even look similar, while the brainchild of SpaceX is almost twice as heavy as the creation of the ULA. This comes from the difference in fuel type and its density. The rockets are launched from two main sites. Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida and Vandenberg Base in California. The launch sites are completely identical. They include all the necessary equipment as well as a final assembly complex where the stages arrive from the Boeing facilities, mainly by sea. The cost of launches of the Boeing's brainchild cannot be called low. The United Launch Alliance asks for at least $150 million for its services, and at the top, for Delta IV Heavy, the cost can reach $400 million. Somehow, it doesn't really fit with all the stories about the struggle for cheapness. Why so expensive? We can say that several factors converged here. In the early 2000s, when the Delta IV was just entering service, Boeing tried to bring it to the open commercial market, but that did not go very well. In the beginning, most potential customers looked at the rocket with caution. It was completely new, pretty innovative, and no one could properly measure the risks. Besides, other carriers gained popularity at that time. First of all, the Russian Protons, which with close capabilities were much cheaper for the customers. Boeing and the ULA concentrated on orders from government structures, and this is initially a limited market. Even the clients like NASA and the Pentagon do not have such resources and needs to flood space with 20 large satellites and planet rovers every year. The number of launches is relatively modest, and this is simple mathematics. Fewer rockets means that each of them is more expensive. And finally, the ULA itself. After the merger of Boeing and Lockheed Martin in the space sector, the two main American carriers, Delta IV and Atlas V, ended up within the walls of the same corporation, which had to maintain two rockets initially competing with each other, with, again, limited demand. 
Another gloomy result of the merger from the economic point of view, the ULA practically turned out to be a monopolist in the domestic market, which to put it mildly is not healthy. They could glue any price tags to their rockets and customers had nowhere to go. The Pentagon would not launch military satellites on Russian rockets. In the US domestic market, the Delta IV and Atlas V could compete perhaps with the Space Shuttle, but its launches were so expensive that the ULA rockets could be coated with gold and fueled with bourbon and still be cheaper. In such a dream world, the Rocketeers lived for 10 years, until their competitors began to grow like mushrooms after the rain, pressing hard on all the weak points. There's a reason why the ULA is making so much effort to keep SpaceX out of government contracts. The competition between the Atlas V and Delta IV influenced both rockets quite strongly. The ULA, trying to make sure that their flagships did not interfere with each other, divided the models by the mass of payloads. The heaviest ones were given to the Delta IV Heavy with its maximum power, and the lighter ones to the Atlas V, which are cheaper than the Delta IV Medium. These versions themselves had to be pushed aside. The Delta IV Medium last launched in 2019, and there's a chance that we will not be seeing it again. At one time, a big stake was made on the Delta IV, and many interesting projects were planned, including expanding capabilities by upgrading the engines and adding more side boosters. In addition, there were plans to perform manned flights, but the fight for cheapness at the beginning of the story played a cruel joke. It turned out that in order to be admitted in terms of reliability and safety for human rate certification, it would be necessary to heavily modify the rocket, first of all the engines, which would be too expensive. For the same reason, the idea of installing the RS-68 on the super heavy SLS rocket had to be abandoned. The good old RS-25 turned out to be more suitable. We can say that in 2014, the heavy rocket lifted the Orion spacecraft into space, but it was a test of the spacecraft without people on board. Orion is being made for the SLS, and in the ULA, the Atlas V is responsible for crew missions. Too high a cost, obsolescence, enormous pressure from progressive competitors and plans to create an entirely new rocket did their job. Delta IV is gradually retiring, and to replace it, the ULA is already making a completely new Vulcan Centaur rocket with the latest Blue Origin BE-4 engines, powered by a newfangled methane liquid oxygen fuel, more powerful solid boosters and a bunch of other interesting features. The rocket is due to arrive in the coming years and replace both the Delta IV and Atlas V, becoming the new single ULA rocket. Such is the full of mixed feelings story of the giant orange delta. I am waiting for your thoughts in the comments below, and of course, rocket likes and cosmic subscriptions. Bright stars and scheduled flights to you.